Good morning, Mr. Gilstrap. Good morning. The book I have called, a new book coming out. The book is called Zero Sum <laughs> by John Gilstrap. It's a great cover, by the way. I'm re I'm thrilled with the cover, actually. It's, yeah. um, it's Jonathan Grave. Uh, it, it's the, I think this is the 16th of the Jonathan Grave books. Go ahead, bring yeah. that up there, Dylan. Just yeah. put that on the screen. Um, yeah, in this one, Jonathan Grave is, um, among other things, is a freelance hostage rescue specialist. That's, that's his background. He's a former Delta Force operator. But he's also the benefactor of a school, a residential school for the children of incarcerated parents. And um, in the, in the opening sequence here, one of the students in the school is killed with an overdose of, of fentanyl that's disguised as candy that is sent to him uh, from one of the cartels as uh, retribution against the boy's father, uh, now, one Robert you, Lo Cicero. Are you aware <laughs> of the fact that uh, in New Zealand they just uncovered candy laced with meth? This is a story this morning in the news. I, I was not, but this is actually based on a thing that has happened before. Oh, okay. this, this getting the drugs into, I don't know what kind of monster would do this. Yeah. Um, but but getting poisoning children through candy, you know, drug laced candy is is actually a thing. Mm -hmm. So um, it's been it's been a theme in the grave books for some time that Jonathan has been has been taking. Has, the The cartels have long been the the enemies of of. Of Jonathan in the books, and this time he's had it. Um, and there's a political element to this too. In, within the confines of the books, the Darmid administration, President Tony Darmid, he's been president since 2009, actually, within the con <laughs> construct of the books. Trump is envious, <laughs> and and, um, and they're just as corrupt as as can be. And uh, it's it's down to the the cabinet level, and and even down to the military ranks. And Jonathan, he's, he's had it, and um, he takes the war to the cartels across the border into Mexico, and that's 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 what the book is about. I'm, I'm about halfway through the book, John, and I'm really enjoying it. But there's a couple of names that keep popping up that are have a familiar ring to them. This is the one where Michael Height, um, he he gave a very generous donation to Hospice of the Panhandle to be uh, named as a character, and he actually starts out as a prison guard. And he's the first one to kind of understand that um, that one of his prisoners, this Mr. Lo Cicero, is that his son was targeted as uh, from the cartels. And once he realizes that, he becomes a target and he can't go back and he becomes part of Jonathan's team, sort of unwittingly, but he doesn't have a lot of choice. You have spent time at the border. I have. And you've talked often about border security and the danger with the cartels and the Mexican border. When, and I remember having conversations with you when you were deciding that this was going to be the topic you were going to be taking on in this book. Does this book have a bit more behind it because you have so much interest in this particular subject, both politically and geographically? Yes. I mean, the, the cartels... I don't people. I don't think people really understand the the depth of cruelty that is woven into the cartels, and and how much power they actually have, and how much money is generated by the by the cartels. And you know, this is not this is not a political segment, and I don't want to go into a political segment. But every border crossing that happens is paid for the uh, coyote is is paid for a cartel is paid mm -hmm. in order for that to happen so there's billions of dollars excuse me john when you paid. say border crossing you're talking about the illegal the, border crossings. the illegal border illegal crossings. illegal okay. border yep. crossings every one of those happens by paying uh money goes goes to the cartels and the cartels don't care who or what is coming across the human trafficking element of it um, the, the sale of, of human beings of all ages and of all sexes. Uh, the, the, I, I've addressed this in a previous book. There's, there is actually a, uh, there's a, a sex tourism trade that is run by the cartels that is just, just horrifying. These are miserable people. And it, it was, it's great to live vicariously through Jonathan and his abilities to go to you know, bring this kind of justice to the bad guys. 
John, you're talking about the cartels. I've had one brief experience with the cartels, kind of a humorous element to it. Uh, Bonnie and I spent some time right in the very southwest part of Arizona uh, on a, uh, a, a small ranch. Uh, and they're only about 15 miles uh, above, uh, north of the border. And the cartels frequented that, that area. On one occasion, uh, one of the individuals coming across fell in a crevasse and broke his leg and the cartel could not pull him out they didn't even try to pull him out what they did was to light the fire the range on fire knowing that some of the ranchers would see the smoke and come and put out the fire in the process they would recognize there's someone in the bottom of the crevasse which is exactly what happened uh, but they could the ranchers could not pull him out and they so they called for a helicopter helicopter came and got him and they uh, did not have him in any sort of a uh, stretcher they just had rope tied under his arms and drug him out of the crevasse and you could see this poor guy going across the horizon yelling and screaming uh, but that is funny. <laughs> it, been, what, That's firehouse yeah, right there. But what, what perspective <laughs> you're looking at it from, Rob? <laughs> living is living. <laughs> I may just pull back into my little shell again. <laughs> that that would be a good dinner circuit stand-up right there, Bill. Yeah, take over, John. <laughs> Actually, I can see why that would be humorous. The guy. Going yeah. across the yeah. air like that, but it was uh, it was an example that they were uh, uh, they could care less about the individuals. They uh, I guess you could care by setting the range on fire. You did have a little bit of compassion, but not very much. Well, that's a that's a tough way to gain attention <laughs> is sure to set is. fire to the area yeah. around the guy. But yeah, big it's wildfire. A, yeah. Uh, so tell me about your time at the southern border because you've been there more than once, correct? I have. Um, the most interesting time I was down there was I. It kind of a convoluted story of how I ended up there, but I ended up spending three days with the BORTAC team, which is the Border Patrol Tactical Team uh, out of uh, El Paso. And how do you arrange something like that? Can anybody it, do that? No. Um, it, it helps to have fans who read the books and say, hey, we want to come and have a tour with BORTAC. Yeah. And um, so I, I went there. Actually, I learned tracking. Not, I didn't learn, learn, but that was, mm -hmm. I learned more about it than than I knew before I went. And riding with these guys, it's amazing what they do. They're, they're essentially a SWAT team, but that are tied to the Border Patrol, but they also do normal uh, patrolling. And um, as we roll along the border with these folks, they tell you exactly which cartel owns their, their are landmarks. You know, from here to here is, uh, I'm making up the, the cartel names. Uh, this is the Sinaloa from here to here, and this is the the chihuahua from here to here and it, it's mm -hmm. everybody knows what's going on they just they're not empowered to to stop it um while i was there one of the border patrol was shot from across the border um and couldn't do anything took off his finger as i recall um the uh and there are there are actually aid stations that are set up in the desert this is you know this is the middle of nowhere you don't this is texas the 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 desert the worst parts of Texas. Um, and uh, if, if there are big stanchions with lights on the top that are water stations that the, once the illegals cross, if they wander far enough and at night, you can see these lights for a long way. If they go to the light, there's water, there's first aid and a phone and they can call and they can be picked up and will be sent back, but at least their lives will be saved. That was, this is, that was a previous administration. Was that under Trump? Yeah. When you write books on this type of subject matter, does it get unwanted attention as well? What do you mean? From people who would prefer you not write on subject matter like this. I am very careful. Um, I'd never mention real cartel names because I don't need that <laughs> mess in my life. Mm -hmm. If uh, you do, how about moving to another county? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, no, I... I, I try to to walk the right line on that because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't need that kind of thing in my life. A lot of some of the um, the issues, some of the bad things that have happened in the books come from real life things that, that have happened. But no, so far, I haven't I haven't received any threats or anything like that. There's no way I would travel down there. In fact, one of the things when I was traveling with the, the my, my Bortec escort, I guess, um, it's one of the legitimate crossings. 
uh, across. And he said, that's, how, that's where you go and do shopping. And I said, so is that something I could do? He said, I think you're crazy if you do, especially with your books. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. I said, do they know I'm here? He said, probably. I said, okay. How would they know? Because they're, they're everywhere. This is, it's a, it's a, it's a real business. It's a multi-billion dollar business. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned about a corrupt political regime, right? In the 1980s, remember the whole cocaine epidemic oh, yeah. and the crack epidemic? And I said to somebody older than I am, I said, there is no way you can pull this off without elected officials and law enforcement being in on it. So hmm. no way. There's no way. No way at all. And that, you'd have to be pretty high up as well. And that was later validated when we found out what the CIA was doing to aid cocaine getting into the country for the operations that they were running. Joe Biden gets accused of being crooked Joe and what have you. I'm not asking you to go into whether or not Joe Biden is crooked, but when you see what you see at the southern border and what's going on around this country, does it make sense to you that this could be happening without somebody important on the payroll? Not to get too conspiracy on you, no, but you're, and, you're and, a writer. And in the absence of anything, any true evidence that I could, you know, take anywhere, I'm not a journalist, right? Um, it's inconceivable to me that this could happen without somebody on the payroll. Somebody has to be looking the other way mm -hmm. for this to happen. Right. And that's certainly what I posit within the book. I didn't mean in, to give in, away your plot. In a, in, a, in a fictional way. In a fictional way, and, right. And, and, it, it, and it's been going on for so long within the confines of the book, the fictional world of, of the book, this has been a moneymaker for, for many, many mm -hmm. generations of politicians. You look at organized crime, for instance. Look at the history of organized crime in this country, which for the longest, I guess early on it was the Irish, then it was the Italians, right? None of that could have existed if it wasn't for police officers and elected officials taking money. It can't exist. It can't go on as as uh, and be, and become as intrinsically a part of society if people aren't being paid off. There is a there is a rotting going on inside this country with drugs, and it it concerns a lot of people because of the extensiveness of it in this country. I don't think it can exist without people being on a payroll in order to help it continue to exist and flourish. And I think you can go pretty high up with it. Well, I mean, I agree with you. And and history show. I mean, if you go, again, I'm not a journalist. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm an entertainer. But if you go back to Serpico, and mm -hmm. you, it's, there's, nothing has changed systemically to prevent the corruption of the past from being the corruption of sure. the present. Nothing. So, yeah. If we wanted to fix it, we're really good at addressing and fixing the problems we really care about. And for whatever reason, the war on drugs has, is a pillow fight on drugs. And I don't really understand why. Well, I do understand. I suspect it's because a lot of people are making a lot of money. Um, so, it, and it's great fodder. Again, I, I, write, I write thrillers. And sometimes I would tell you, Bill and I have talked about that. I think we've all talked about this off the air. It, it's an occupational hazard that where I go in my head to write the books I write, it's sometimes it's hard not for that, for that mindset not to infect my worldview in the real world. Mm -hmm. And I confess that up front. Sometimes it really, there's a cynicism that, that sure. comes into that, that that is sometimes hard to, to separate. And I think it's reflected here in the show sometimes. Yeah, and I think John is is right on this, and I applaud him. Uh, I come from a different world altogether. I come from a very small town where crime was non-existent. You did not really think of it. Then went into the structured environment of the military where everything was very, very uh, disciplined, if you will. So I... Uh, uh, 
I read books like this where there's a strong conspiracy element, and I have some trouble identifying with it. I have some trouble rationalizing it exists, but I know it does, and you, you made the point very effectively a while ago, and I, and I think it's, it's reflected to some degree of the environment that we, have, we were raised in and the environment that we lived in. John, what happens next with this book? Tomorrow is the release day, correct? Tomorrow's the drop dead date, or the drop date. It's not the drop dead date, the drop date. And what, so, is, what does that mean, drop date? Um, that's when it's widely available. I you see. can buy it now. You can get it tomorrow. Do you get an autographed one for every purchase that you make, like I have, for instance? Um, we, we have to cross paths somehow. <laughs> yeah. Are you but as I said, I, I've read the first half of it, and I've read several John's books, and I, I'm really enjoying this one. Thank guy. you. Yeah. And uh, so where, where do you go to do your book selling now? What's, what's your next tour stop, so to speak? Actually, I don't have a tour plan for this. This, this drops at a time that I'm, life is a little bit on the crazy side. So mm -hmm. there'll be a, a book signing probably after I finish some travel in September. So you haven't said anything up. There was a no. bookstore that you mentioned inside uh, on your... Four thinking. Seasons Books is yeah. in, in Shepherdstown is my go-to bookstore yeah. and by the way thank you you made a nice uh, thank you in the back for hiring you as a co-host at, at the incredible pay it, it, well yeah i mean it's it pays my mortgage <laughs> and, and then some <laughs> yeah and then some right do you have a lot of uh uh technical support when you write a book like this in regards to uh, weaponry and uh, espionage and dealing with cartels and such um i have people who will answer my phone calls uh, good friends of mine who are DEA agents and and special forces operators and what have you. But I've been doing this enough. One of the reasons yeah, I go to the SHOT Show every year. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I go to the SHOT Show every year is I buy a lot of these guys a lot of drinks. We sit around and they answer a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. And I get to shoot a lot of stuff. When you did your first book, obviously your support network for getting facts correct was much smaller than it is now. How, how has it expanded from book one to this? Is this 29? Yeah. To book 29, and how do you write a book number one without knowing all the people that you know now? I wrote a different kind of book. So it was that Nathan's Run, the first book, was much smaller in, it, in its scope. It dealt with, um, it, didn't, it didn't deal with international, th this sort of issues. It, it dealt with a, a kid who was escaping a juvenile detention center. Mm -hmm. And there, I was actually involved with the community juvenile detention center at a, at a volunteer level. So. How, how much of this information is available in open literature? What I'm getting at was the hunt for Red October. Supposedly all the information was gathered from the open literature. Well, it, it was. He got in a lot of trouble. Clancy did. Mm -hmm. But um, but he, he was able to prove his, his point. There's nothing classified in anything that, that I write. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and the stuff, the only time I've been challenged on anything, um, and it was by... A friend of mine who's a SEAL who was very angry, be, be, book long ago, um, because he thought I had shared a secret and actually it was something I had made up. And I said, thank you. It's good, <laughs> good to know, I guess, right? But you know, if, if there's any technology that can track someone, kill someone, or trace their money, there's got to be a CIA development project for it somewhere. And if I can think of it, somebody else has. No doubt. And in this, and in this case, that's what had happened. So, what does your publisher do with the books now? How many, how many do they print? Where do they go? And uh, how many will actually just be ebooks as opposed to uh, paperbacks? I don't know. Um, I don't know how many they print. That's almost none of my business. I don't care. Mm -hmm. um, limitless ebooks because they're just electrons, uh, and they'll be everywhere. And then, how does it work for you to actually make money on a book? Uh, what, what's this? What's this book going to sell? I think it's ten bucks. Ten bucks, right? So I assume you get some kind of an, an advance. Do you have to? Do you have to pay all that back out of the book sales before you actually see money on this? Yeah, they they pay me in advance, and then the, the there's X amount per book sold, and as a royalty, when those royalties equal the advance, then I start making additional royalties in advance. I usually earn out the advance within about five or six months yeah john what dictates a soft copy uh, as opposed to hard copy book well the it, it used to be are we on time we got plenty of time uh it used to be that like when i first published in 1996 when my first book came out the the paperback was the big money maker 
Remember those big racks of paperbacks? Mm -hmm. Back in the old days, you don't see them anymore. So a hardcover, the 20, well, back then it was probably $14 um, hardcover was whatever you got paid. But the big money came when you got the paperback deal, which came from a different publisher because that's what people would buy. And that market, the paperback market, kind of kind of went away. So when I don't have a lot of time. So we have different forms of paperbacks. This one, when the first of the Grave series came out, um, it came out as a paperback at six ninety nine, I think. Mm -hmm. And that's how we got people addicted. So <laughs> so we, they're not going to pay 25 bucks for a Grave book. My other books come out as hardcovers. So that's... Final 50 seconds on the program after we return. After 